Today, the area of Western Sahara is one of the most desolate and sparsely populated regions in the world. Incredibly dry and battered by winds, there is seemingly just sand and stone stretching to the horizons. Yet what makes the region so fascinating is that despite the desolation, it is home to hundreds of stone structures that are thousands of years old. What made this area so special that it compelled large groups of people to gather and construct the monuments? What was the purpose of the structures? Deepening these unsolved mysteries is the fact that the region today is a conflict zone, which prevents researchers from being able to fully study the region. The area of Western Sahara, where the stone structures exist, is a disputed region where the governments of Morocco and the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic have fought over. Today, a wall of fortifications, built by Morocco, separates its territorial claims in the region from the Sahrawi-controlled sector, which is called the Free Zone. Between 2002 and 2009, archaeologists worked extensively in the Free Zone, and it is thanks to sporadic research projects like this, and a few others that were conducted when the political situation was more stable, that many fascinating but tentative answers have been revealed. Ever since the region that we know today as the Sahara Desert formed millions of years ago, it has continuously undergone cyclical periods of environmental change. Approximately every 20,000 years, the region shifts to a savanna, if it is a desert, and if the region is a savanna, then it shifts to a desert. Between 22,000 to 10,500 years ago, humans did not live in the Sahara region outside the Nile Valley. Additionally, the desert was significantly larger compared to today, and stretched 250 miles further south. 10,000 years ago, the Earth's rotation shifted slightly, causing the Sahara region to receive more sunlight, which triggered a climate that regularly received monsoon rains. Due to the rains, the Sahara underwent a transition from a dry and arid environment to that of a humid environment, which produced a landscape similar to that of a savanna abounding with animals. This prompted Nile Valley inhabitants to begin to settle the Sahara. Between 9,000 to 7,300 years ago, the monsoons continued to rain down upon the region, producing substantial plant growth leading to the establishment of human settlements and the introduction of domesticated animals into the region. Humans in the region lived off of hunting and gathering. In the central region, they even lived in permanent settlements. Around 7,000 years ago, they began constructing monuments atop animals, like cattle, that they buried. Between 6,000 and 5,200 years ago, the region's humid phase ended. Rainfall ceased in many regions of the Sahara by 5,000 years ago. As it became increasingly harder to extract food from the land, cattle herding was adopted by all the peoples of the region. These people created rock art in caves, depicting gazelles and antelopes, as well as animals that do not exist in the region anymore, such as giraffes, elephants, and rhinos. Around fire pits, they used their stone tools and pottery. As cattle herding grew in prominence, a cult began to develop around the practice, which spread quickly throughout the central Sahara region. By 6,500 years ago, the Sahara peoples were building funerary monuments atop humans and animals that were buried alongside each other. However, by 5,500 years ago, the Sahara peoples were only burying humans underneath the constructed monuments. This coincided with an increase in the population of people around the few remaining areas of the Sahara that had sources of water, such as rivers and oases. Between 5,200 and 5,000 years ago, the Nile River Valley and the Libyan Fezzan both saw their populations of humans increase dramatically. The population boom in the Nile River Valley region would eventually lead to the development of ancient Egyptian civilization. Many groups of peoples became more settled and began to roam around less. However, for those who lived at higher elevations herding goats and sheep, their mobile lifestyle continued unchanged. By 5,000 years ago, these activities were eventually replaced with the herding of domesticated cattle. The Sahara inhabitants herded their cattle to mountainous areas when dry seasons arrived, and to low elevation areas when rains were plentiful. This strategy of cattle tending is called transhumance. As much of the Sahara dried up and became increasingly difficult to live upon, the Western Sahara region retained a plentiful amount of water, lakes, and plants. 
Migrants from across the prehistoric landscape, encompassing the present-day countries of Morocco, Libya, Algeria, Mauritania, and Mali, would have gone to the area of Western Sahara, seeking water and food for their cattle. By 1,900 years ago, the inhabitants of Western Sahara increasingly began to gather in valleys carved by rivers and around oases. At this point, the hunter-gatherer populations have been replaced by groups of people herding cattle. Throughout much of the time that the Sahara was inhabited by humans, and in particular in the western parts, the people there built countless monumental funerary stone structures, all of which turned the region into a dense and complex funerary landscape. The inhabitants used the natural contours of the landscape to enhance their constructions. In particular, many parts of the Western Sahara were frequently visited by people who created stone structures atop buried individuals. The inhabitants of Western Sahara also created a vast amount of art upon rocks depicting cattle. We know that the Sahara Desert used to be a savanna teeming with life thanks to the work of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which extracted soil samples off of the coast of West Africa. Analyzing particles from these samples that date back to 240,000 years ago, researchers were able to construct a framework that explained how a once verdant region morphed into one dominated by desert sand. MIT also established that the Sahara Desert region shifts between a desert or a savanna once every 20,000 years. Evidence left behind by dust storms over time spans ranging in the thousands of years were analyzed. Each subsequent dust storm produced a unique layer of sediment that could be dated. Researchers at MIT described the interpretation of the sediments produced by the dust storms as akin to reading tree rings. As for what precisely caused this 20,000 year cyclical shift in the environment of the Sahara region, scientists say that it has to do with a change in the tilt of Earth's rotation. When the Earth's rotation shifts in a certain way, the Sahara region can get more sunlight, prompting an increase in heavy rains which makes the Sahara fertile for plant growth. Deep in the western Sahara desert, just north of the oasis town of Tiferidi, lays hundreds of stone structures that are thousands of years old, dating to between 10,000 to 3,000 years ago. Archaeologists are unsure how old the monuments are, but contextual evidence in the form of stone tools, pottery, and rock art confirms their prehistoric origin. Furthermore, only minimal excavations have been performed, and only a few artifacts have been found that can be dated using the carbon-14 method. The stone structures vary greatly in size and shape. Some are shaped like crescents, while others consist of rocks positioned in circular patterns. Furthermore, some consist of rocks placed in straight lines, while others consist of rocks placed in rectangular platform shapes. Additionally, there is a site where 64 stones are positioned upright, amidst surrounding hills topped by burial mounds. Out of all the structures, the burial mounds are the largest, and can range between 20 or 30 feet high, and 60 feet in diameter. Many monuments are aligned with the cardinal points of a compass, such as the north, south, east, and west directions. Furthermore, many monuments are also aligned with the features of the landscape. To this day, the purpose of the structures are unknown. Archaeologists think that the crescent-shaped monuments were either used as hiding spots for hunting, as areas to trap animals into to make them easier to hunt, or that they were used as a way to manage the flow of water from rains. However, researchers think that the structures may mark the location of graves, or alternatively, the construction of rocks could have been part of funerary rituals. Bolstering these theories are the two sites that the archaeologists managed to excavate, which consist of rock piles atop human burials dating back to 1,500 years ago. Below the rock pile, at the bottom of the burial chamber, archaeologists found the skeletal remains of an adult female. Alongside the remains were found beads made from ostrich eggs and carnelian, as well as a metal point made of iron. Archaeologists theorize that the great variety of monuments in the area reflects all the different cultures that migrated there. It has been suggested that the migrants from across the Sahara region traveled to the area of Western Sahara periodically over the millennia, whenever the water sources in their home territories became scarce or non-existent, because the Western Sahara region was always consistently plentiful with water. Migrations like these would have happened sporadically even when the Sahara was still a savanna, as even during these phases there were periods of dryness.
Supporting this theory is the fact that the Western Sahara region today still gets much more rain than the other regions of the Sahara, due in part to the area's location near the Atlantic Ocean. Being near the ocean leads to a more humid climate, which in turn leads to weather events that release rain that promote the growth of lots of plants and trees. In contrast, the other areas of the Sahara Desert are devoid of plants, outside of oases and areas of high elevation. Archaeologists think that as the Sahara Desert morphed over a time span of thousands of years from a savanna into the arid region that it is today, cattle herder groups began to increasingly fight with each other over the resources, and as a result became more territorial. Researchers think that the sizable resource expenditure dedicated to funerary monument construction for most likely important individuals is a strong indicator of social stratification. Regarding who precisely constructed the monuments, archaeologists have three main theories. The first is that the monuments were constructed at a time before the onset of aridity, when groups of herders lived across the region of the Sahara and were connected with each other. The second theory is that they were built soon after large parts of the Sahara became uninhabitable. The third theory is that the monuments were built by populations living in the Western Sahara region who became cut off from the rest of the desert region after it became uninhabitable, and as a result, developed their own unique construction style in isolation. The only way to test these theories thoroughly is to gather more materials that can be used to date the stone monuments by looking for clues on the surface and undertaking excavation work. The discovery of a metal point made of iron indicates to the archaeologists that many of the monuments may not be older than 4,000 years, as this is the earliest possible time the metalworking is known to have reached the Sahara. In northern Mauritania, there are copper mines and a smelting site at Apjut that date from between the 9th and 2nd century BC. These sites highly suggest to researchers that there may have been contact between the peoples of the Sahara region and the Carthaginian Empire in North Africa. Furthermore, there is more evidence of trade contacts with coastal peoples found in association with the monuments, due to the discovery of marine shells. The discovery of carnelian beads also suggests that the monument builders were active in Saharan trade networks in the western and central parts of the desert. However, much of these theories are speculative, and archaeologists say they must do more research in the western Sahara region in order to come back with more definitive answers. For example, the researchers hope to gather more soil samples containing pollen so that they can determine where certain tracts of vegetation existed, which could then lead to the discovery of the locations of bodies of water. They also hope to find more burial mounds so that they can figure out what the Western Sahara people ate and how healthy they were. Unfortunately though, scientists are unable to currently work in the region of the Western Sahara due to it being too dangerous at the moment. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed my documentary, don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash world chronicles.